Great, great pleasure to welcome our viewers here to a two-part segment of Modern Medicine with Doc Moylan. I'm Dr. Dave Moylan, Medical Director of the Simon Kramer Cancer Institute in New Philadelphia in Schuylkill County, and I am so pleased to introduce to our viewers Dr. Cyril Wecht. And you Pleasure are, to be here, Doctor. You are probably the most distinguished physician that we've had on modern medicine since its inception. That's, uh, uh, well, we've had quite a few uh, <laughs> famous people. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, this, uh, you're no stranger to Simon Kramer Institute no. in that you were here in the spring for our eighth annual forensic science uh, conference. He gave a magnificent talk on very It was a wonderful program, yes. And we enjoyed you here. And then <clears throat> today we've just toured the, the facility, including our what we call the mobile uh, morgue, and you helped us out uh, in that regard, and we'll get back to that. But our uh, friendship started, if you'll recall, in the summer of 2011, and when I was uh, figuring out how to uh, become a coroner and uh, run for the office, I came out and visited you in Pittsburgh in your office, and we had a delightful uh, lunch. But uh, I, I would like to introduce you to the citizens of Schuylkill County and tell us a little bit about your background and how you became interested in the rather morose field of uh, pathology and the subfield forensic pathology. What attracted you to it? Well, um, from the time I was a baby, uh, my father, uh, who was an immigrant, told me I was going to be a doctor. I was an only child and there was never any question in my mind and I just went to college, pre-med, and applied to medical school and got in. I was very active on campus in my undergraduate days at the University of Pittsburgh and I don't know, maybe that might have been the beginning of uh, thinking of law because everybody assumed that someone active on campus in organizations uh, was a pre-law student. In any event, I started medical school. And I began to think more uh, and more about legal medicine, working at the interface of these two great professions. I finally made contact with the top person in the field at that time through the uh, American Medical Association, and uh, he invited me to attend a conference they were conducting in New York City. It was the first of uh, biennial AMA, ABA meetings, and uh, just quite fortuitous that um, he, from California, attending and the keynote speaker in New York City, um, was contacted by me then and gracious enough to invite me. I went there. No, you were a student at this time? I was time? a medical student in my third year. And um, following that conversation, when I finally learned something that was real, meaningful, and correct about what you could do working in that field, I made a decision to get a law degree. After I made that decision, and upon completing my internship, which was obligatory in those days after medical school, one year of internship, I began to think about what specialty in medicine interfaced most often in a most significant, substantial way with the law civil and criminal matters and it quickly became evident that was forensic pathology so I decided I would apply then for pathology residency and I also applied for law school I was accepted to both I got permission from my chief and the, the university department at Pitt Medical School um, where I was doing my residency at the VA hospital uh, to go to law school at Pitt Law School as long as I did all the work that was required of me. And so I did the two years of pathology residency 
and two years of law school. Then the Air Force grabbed me. I had been deferred. I uh, was fortunate to be stationed at a large Air Force hospital, got credit for the two years of pathology residency, my third and fourth years. And then what I needed when I finished my military duty was one more year of law school and one year fellowship in forensic pathology. I applied to the University of Maryland School of Law for the evening division. I was accepted there and I did my fellowship in forensic pathology in the office of the Chief Medical Examiner of Maryland in Baltimore. So I finished that and um, that then was the springboard. I returned to Pittsburgh and began to work in pathology, hospital pathology, private laboratory, and then forensic pathology, um, which continued um, to this day. What year are we talking that you've kind of put the whole enchilada yeah, put it all together. together? Yes, um, um, medical school graduation, 56, internship into 57. The five years of pathology residency, 57 to 62, including that fellowship in forensic pathology, also uh, was the period of time in which I was able to squeeze in three years of law school and two years of Air Force duty as a captain, uh, associate pathologist uh, at Montgomery, Alabama, Air Force Base, Maxwell. So those are the years. In 1962, I returned to Pittsburgh. I had met my wife in the Air Force. We got married in the fall of 61. And we came back to Pittsburgh then when I finished in the summer of 62. And I started to do work both in pathology and in the field of legal medicine. In fact, I became a partner in a law firm for a while. I began medical legal consultations for attorneys. I was an assistant district attorney um, and medical legal advisor to the Allegheny County DA for a, a year and a half or so, 64, 65. Then from 66 to 70, I was the chief forensic pathologist of the Allegheny County Coroner's Office. 1970 to 1980, I was the elected coroner of Allegheny County. Then and I left the office, I was county commissioner, and I was doing other things. I returned as coroner in 1996, and I spent 10 more years as elected coroner to 2006. So 20 years as coroner, four years as chief forensic pathologist. During all of that time, beginning in the late 60s, I began to do autopsies for coroners in surrounding southwestern Pennsylvania counties. And to this day, I do autopsies for Armstrong, Fayette, Green, and Westmoreland counties. I also do private autopsies for families. There are two going on in Pittsburgh today by my colleague because I'm here. Another one scheduled tomorrow, another private coming on Monday from Maryland. And I do then the coroner's autopsies. Altogether, these amount to more than 500 a year. Uh, and I've been doing these now, as I say, the number has been increasing. And of course, the drug deaths have increased tremendously. It used to be 350, 375. Beginning in 2017, 2018, into this year, the number has burgeoned into the 500 plus field because of the drug epidemic. We have seen that also at the local level. It's, it's universal. But um, you talked about your uh, fellowship in forensic pathology. My understanding, you know, trying to research it in our own state, you guys are scarcer than hen's teeth. You know, uh, there aren't. There there's aren't. about 30 in the, in the whole state. Uh, a little bit more than that. Um, maybe when you researched it some years ago, there are more than that. However, not many people do work in the field full time. Yeah. One of the reasons is it doesn't pay as much as a hospital pathologist gets paid. Uh, you just don't make as much money being a medical examiner or a forensic pathologist in an ME or coroner's office. The other reason is that uh, many of the offices don't permit you to do other things. So uh, it is not indeed a field uh, which is uh, burgeoning yeah. with people uh, knocking on the doors. Well, can you comment on the popularity of forensics that has occurred with the uh, television shows that are on there. Yes, forensic sciences as a field of study, um, that field has blossomed incredibly. 
I recall, and I'm sure you're younger than I, I bet you that you too will recall when you were in college, there was no such thing as a forensic uh, program, forensic science program. If they called it forensic, they meant debate and theater. There's no such thing as a forensic scientific course. Now, I bet you that there are at least a thousand colleges and universities, including community colleges, that have a forensic science criminal justice program. How did that come about? Well, quite uh, fortuitously, I think a combination of fiction and nonfiction. In the world of fiction, we saw the television program Quincy, Jack Klugman, and then other programs, and then even talk show hosts began to cover these things. Uh, like I probably did more than Geraldo, 50 Geraldo Rivera shows in my uh, career when he was active, and probably more than 25 Larry King shows, and then others, Greta Van Susteren, and Nancy Grace, and, and others. At the same time, then, in real life, we were getting cases of great interest. Elvis Presley, Sonny Von Bulow, Gene Harris, and then Ron Brown and Vincent Foster, and then the biggies of O.J. Simpson and John Benet Ramsey, and then on into yeah, Phil Spector and uh, Chandra Levy, and, and so on. Uh, so those things together uh, have resulted as an incredible catalyst for people in America, for young students who then want to get into forensic science, and that's why all of these colleges and universities have the programs. And then other people who are out of school, they want to watch uh, these programs and uh, attend um, lectures and so on. And some uh, take uh, courses that maybe don't have a diploma, but maybe a certificate or so on. So it is certainly from an academic standpoint, I would say unquestionably the hottest item. You can't think of one subject, and I don't mean to denigrate in any way the significance and importance of other fields of <clears throat> academic endeavor, but there's no field that you can think of at all that has in a quarter of a century led to the adoption, the implementation and presentation of programs in universities and colleges that did not exist. Yeah as of the mid to late 1970s. Well, sir, we have seen that even in our small county where uh, at Penn State campuses, uh, many people in criminal justice. We're gonna take a commercial break right now. When we come back, we wanna talk about some of your more, more challenging cases, more controversial cases. Welcome back. Modern Medicine with Dr. Dave Moylan. I am so pleased to be interviewing our distinguished guest, Dr. Cyril Wecht, who's a, a renowned forensic pathologist. He's joining us from Pittsburgh uh, today. We're so nice pleased to be with you, he could be here. And I would like to talk about some of your more challenging cases when you were visiting here for our eighth annual forensic symposium, and I hope we can get you back next spring for number nine. I'll be delighted. But there was, um, you t touched upon, upon uh, some very high profile cases, which, and I don't want to pick one out for you, but which one would you like well, to comment on? Well, the number on? one case, chronologically, in terms of my involvement in, in some uh, you know, national uh, exposure, unquestionably, is JFK, the JFK assassination which I remain very actively involved with uh, to this time. I'm chairman of a national group, Kappa Committee Against Political Assassinations. We're still pursuing this, trying to get that case reopened. Then other cases chronologically followed. Uh, the assassination of Senator Robert F. Kennedy. The assassination of Reverend Martin Luther King. The Mary Jo Kopechny case involving Ted Kennedy. Then uh, thinking, uh, uh, Jean Harris, uh, the woman who was charged with killing her lover, uh, the, diet doctor, uh, the cardiologist who wrote the first big uh, diet book, I'll think it'll come to me in a moment. Uh, and then um, um, uh, Sonny Von Bulow, um, famous case, uh, worked with a prominent uh, um, Harvard law professor, Alan Dershowitz, on that case. And then um, um, as cases unfolded, uh, uh, Elvis Presley, uh, Marilyn Monroe, 
uh, Chandra Levy, the young uh, student intern, congressional intern in D.C., um, and then um, uh, Secretary of Commerce Ron Brown, whose plane crashed over there in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and then Vincent Foster, a uh, legal White House counsel, close personal friend um, and former legal partner of Hillary Clinton, um, and then um, the Waco Branch Davidian fire, the uh, John Benet Ramsey case, um, O.J. Simpson, uh, Phil Spector, uh, Whitney Houston. Um, so these are the cases. I'm sure I've left out some, but those well, are the major ones. You know ones. what? You just gave me an idea for. We could do a uh, a second version of Billy Joel's "We Didn't Light the Fire," <laughs> and we pick up where JFK blown away, and then take the rest of it up to the modern era. Um, yes, uh, you could do that. JFK. We don't have time to get into it, but what it boils down to is if you believe um, the lone gunman, then you have to accept the single bullet theory. One bullet producing seven wounds in Kennedy and Connolly, leaving out the head wounds. Just seven wounds, a bullet going into Kennedy, back, out his neck, through Connolly's chest, in and out, and then through Connolly's wrist, into his left thigh. A, an incredible bullet indeed. I wish that I had time. Uh, there's no way, of course. And then the head wounds, there are really two shots to the head fired simultaneously, one from the right front behind a picket fence on the grassy knoll and the other from the rear. Then Robert Kennedy... Well, wait, uh, before yeah, we sorry, go, go on with JFK, you did uh, show as part of your visual talk in April this pristine bullet Yes, that was able to accomplish, accomplish all these all things. A weight loss of one and a half percent despite leaving fragments of itself yeah. in three anatomic locations of the president and Governor Connolly. Uh, the bullet completely intact despite breaking, shattering uh, two bones, destroying five inches of Governor Connolly's rib and a comminuted fracture of the radius, which of course uh, you know uh, is a dense heavy bone and adults, uh, people who are not uh, medical don't know that that bone broadens as it comes to the wrist and you're talking about a six point six foot four big bone Texan like John Connolly and you're talking about some dainty 90 pound uh, woman yeah. so to produce those fractures and emerge without any deformity and with a weight loss of one and a half percent and then the trajectory of course and I like to show this yeah. when I demonstrate and give my talk the bull that goes in the Kennedy's back it's now moving according to the Warren Commission from behind um, uh, above and to the right of the president. Sixth floor window, southeast corner, Texas School Depository, Oswald. So the bullet comes in. To begin with, it has an, an 11 degree upward angle through the president's upper chest, out his neck, and then emerging leftward, turns in midair 18, 20 inches to hit Connolly behind his right armpit. Connolly, who is seated directly in front of the president, the bullet doesn't hit him on the left side. It goes to his right armpit, exits below the level of the nipple on the Zapruder film, the most important photographic documentation of those events in Dealey Plaza that day, Friday, November 22, 1963. You see, unquestionably, the governor's Stetson hat is being held here as he's looking to his admiring crowd. Here, the bullet emerging below nipple level, coming downward, hooks back up and around, goes into the back of the wrist, exits from the wrist, goes into the left thigh. One smart bullet. One smart bullet. Yeah. On the, on the uh, night of the autopsy at Bethesda Naval Center in D.C., the pathologist didn't even find the exit hole for the bullet that had entered the back. They thought it was a tracheostomy, yeah. which had been performed, superimposed upon the bullet hole. Yeah. They didn't know until the next day that there was a bullet hole there. So on Friday night, they had the bullet coming out from his back from CPR administered anteriorly, forcing the bullet back out through the lengthy channel into his clothing. The Saturday morning the next day, they learned about the bullet hole in the neck. Now the bullet came out six inches, saw the starch white collar, got frightened to death, and just stopped dead. And then five months later, under the single bullet theory, now that bullet has been re-energized, has been revitalized. Now it's come out the neck, gone around and then through the governor's wrist into the governor's thigh and now as of march april 64 uh, the stretcher bullet which is where this bullet was found the magic bullet commission exhibit 399 that bullet is now from Connolly's left thigh so you got three different places where that bullet 
uh, went according to the official government people, depending on what they needed at a given moment in time. That is the Warren Commission report, which two thirds or three fourths of American public have rejected from the very beginning. Well, Cyril, the president of the United States, money should be no object. Well, obviously. We could get the best forensic pathologist in the and world. they were all there, one hour drive flying time, New York, Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, um, Virginia, and Cleveland. The best, the most famous forensic pathologists were in those cities I've just mentioned. In fact, the chief ME of New York City had his bag packed. He was certain that he was gonna be called in. He was the dean of the field, Milton Halpern. Yes, they called in two guys, career, military pathologist, Humes and Boswell by name, who had never done a single gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. I always want to emphasize that for people who believe in the Warren Commission. For Americans, I don't care, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, this is your country, this is your leader, uh, this is the assassination of your president, and this is the way in which it was handled. That's a formidable task for the most experienced forensic pathologist, multiple gunshot wounds to determine angle, range, sequence, trajectory, and then to correlate the wounds in Kennedy with the wounds in Connolly. That's a very, very tough baby to deal with. And to get two guys who have never done a gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers is like getting somebody, because he has an MD degree, to do coronary artery surgery uh, or extensive bowel surgery with tumor all over the place. Because I got my MD degree. Well, sure, that's okay. Go ahead and operate on my heart, operate on my liver or lungs. You would be appalled. Anybody, anybody. A 10-year-old kid would know better than that. If you said, hey, uh, 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 Mr. Third, fourth grader, tell me what, what kind of a doctor are we? I, my, 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 my grandma has a heart problem. A 10-year-old kid will say, well, don't you want to get one of those doctors or surgeons that, that deal with the heart, right? Yeah, of course. Disgraceful, yeah. abominable. Yeah. All right, you mentioned the um, Robert Kennedy. Kennedy. Uh, what can you tell us about that uh, Well, what I can tell you is that Sirhan was a shooter and there was a second shooter. The bullet that killed Senator Kennedy was fired above, slightly behind his right ear from a distance of one to one and a half inches. That's the official autopsy report. I was one of the consultants. There were three military forensic pathologists and several other top-notch forensic pathologists along with the chief, Dr. Tom Noguchi. One to one and a half inches with a slightly forward trajectory. Sirhan was in front. I'm Sirhan, and you're Robert Kennedy. You just won the California primary. You're walking out through the kitchen of the Ambassador Hotel because they don't want to get you out there in that crowd, and you're walking toward me, and I'm Sirhan, and I shoot bang, bang, bang. I ask people how far, four feet, six feet, eight feet, one, to one and a half inches entering that, above and behind the right That's almost ear. a contact wound. Yeah, that, that we call that we call that close range or near near contact. Yes. yes. Well, um, I don't recall hearing anything about it in the news reports. It never came out. Never came out. The defense attorney never had a forensic pathology criminalist ballistic expert never cross-examined Dr. Noguchi at the trial. Dr. Noguchi had the autopsy report, would have said what I have just stated to you. He was never asked on cross-examination, what was the distance, Dr. Noguchi, from which the fatal shot was fired? Never asked. Cyril, this reminds me of the famous remark by Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, let sleeping dogs lie. But if it's really important, get the newspaper to do it. Very good. So very I think good. we're going to have to wrap up this first uh, segment. But it's been a, a true pleasure to have you, you here. My and pleasure. we'll get you back okay. uh, for round two. Thank you.